נעבור למקבלי הפרס. ראשית הייתי מבקש להציג את פרופסור ירדנה סמואלס ממכון ויצמן, ואחרי שעברתי, אני פוגש אותה לראשונה כאן, אבל אני מכיר אותך כי נכנסתי לאינטרנט, הגדרתי אותך כ-International Recognized Leader in Melanoma Genomics. זאת הייתה ההגדרה שלי. נספר לכם מספר מילים עליה. תואר ראשון בקיימברידג', תואר שני באוניברסיטה העברית בירושלים, PhD במכון לודוויג באימפריאל קולג' באנגליה, פוסט דוק באימפריאל קולג' באנגליה ובהמשך בג'ונס הופקינס יוניברסיטי, תחת הדרכתם של מובילי גדולי הדור, ווגלסטיין, קינזלר וולקולסקו. במכון ויצמן, פרופסור סמואלס היא אסושיאט פרופסור במחלקה ל... מולקולה סל ביולוגי, היא נושאת בקתדרה על שם משפחת קנל במכון ויצמן והיא גם מנהלת במכון אקהארד לקנסר דיאגנוזיס, מורוס אינטגרטד קנסר סנטר בוויצמן. המעבדה של פרופסור סמואלס מתרכזת בזיהוי ובאפיון של מוטציות שמשחקות תפקיד בהתקדמות של מלנומה ו... ברקורד שלה 18 פרסים חשובים, חברה במערכות עיתונים של ארבעה עיתונים מקצועיים במקצוע בינלאומיים, אד הוק רוויור בעיתונים חשובים וחברה ב-National Human Genome Research Institute של ה-NIH. היא כתבה 52 מאמרים מדעיים, 15 אדיטוריאלס, סקירות ו... פרקים בספרים, ויש בזכותה שבעה פטנטים. כאן אני אעבור לאנגלית, כי קשה מאוד לתרגם את הדברים הללו. פרופסור סמואלס דיסקאברד that the gene encoding PIK3CA is mutated in 32% of colorectal cancer patients and in many human cancers, making it one of the most highly mutated oncogenes in human malignancy. ובעקבות זה אחרים עוסקים באותו PIK3CA. דוקטור סמואלס established a high quality melanoma tumor bank to map the melanoma genetic landscape. She was the first to perform genome-wide sequencing of this tumor type. דוקטור סמואלס described a novel tumor suppressor gene whose inactivation is associated with reduced melanoma patient survival. The, one of her studies already paved the way to establishing a phase two clinical trial in melanoma patients. כאן אתם רואים את פרופסור סמואלס במעבדה. ואני אסכם במספר משפטים שכתבו אנשים עליה. ברד ווגלסטיין כתב עליה, ירדנה היא simply outstanding, she is original and tenacious, an independent thinker who quickly perceives the key questions to ask. She has demonstrated both vision and courage and has tackled many challenging experiments allowing her to achieve several firsts. I can thus recommend Yardena for the Udim Family Prize in the strong possible terms and without reservations. וועדת הפרס כתבה, פרופסור סמואלס היא חוקרת מובילה ברמה בינלאומית שעבודתה הובילה לתגליות מדעיות פורצות דרך. לפרופסור סמואלס שיתופי פעולה מדעיים רבים עם חוקרים בארץ ובחו"ל ועבודתה זוכה לתמיכת מענקי מחקר יוקרתיים. אנחנו עכשיו נרצה לשמוע את הרצאתך. בבקשה, תודה. So first of all, thank you for this prize. It's a very, very big honor. It's very prestigious. Thank you very much for that introduction uh, to Professor Cotton, Bayer, the family, Yudaim. Um, I'm celebrating 10 years since my lab was established with all the uh, ups and downs. I have here members of my lab at the Weizmann Institute who actually do uh, the work extremely brilliant and ambitious uh, young scientists who have supported me over uh, the years. Of course, without my husband, who is also here in the audience. And uh, uh, congratulations also to <laughs> Professor Ido Wolf on the prize. So uh, now to some science. Uh, so indeed, uh, we've been working on melanoma over the last 10 years. And today I'll be talking uh, not only about the functional genomics of melanoma, but also a new direction that we've recently developed, which is the uh, neoantigenic landscape. 
Okay, so many of you will recognize uh, this figure. Uh, it was developed uh, by Bert Vogelstein, uh, and it's therefore called by many the Vogelgram. It basically shows the development of colorectal cancer uh, in uh, various different histological stages. Uh, but what he was able to find is that these various stages are linked to molecular changes. Uh, and so this really made a paradigm shift in the whole field because now we know that this applies uh, to basically all the solid cancers. I was very lucky to uh, do my postdoctoral doctoral studies under uh, his supervision as well as Victor Velkulesko and Kenneth Kinsler and to identify uh, the PIK3CA mutations which as you see here are not only extremely prevalent and today is known to uh, be the second most important oncogene in human cancer but you can also see these are particular mutations and they cluster. So this is an excellent diagnostic uh, target and also today a therapeutic target. And this really convinced me to go into cancer genetics when I become an independent investigator and I chose to work on a uh, melanoma. Okay, so melanoma develops from a single melanocyte within the epidermis. It then develops to various different stages all the way to disseminated disease. Again, these various stages is linked to molecular changes, and when I established my lab in 2006, very little was known about the genetic basis of the disease. Mainly it was known that BRAF, a well-known uh, oncogene, serotonin kinase, is mutated in 50% of cases, but clearly there was much more to be done. And in order to uh, work on this, we established a robust tumor bank together with many clinicians um, around the world, but mainly uh, Dr. Steven Rosenberg at the NCI. Uh, and I have a slide there showing that not only do we have tumors from these patients, but we also have cell lines which means that we can actually work with these in tissue culture. We have the clinical information, we have the T cells from the patients, and of course, uh, the normal, the blood. Uh, and so this has been an extremely useful resource that we've been using over the years to characterize the disease. Uh, now, the disease is an extremely aggressive disease and had very few uh, options, therapeutic options, as you can see in this uh, figure. Only recently, in the last six years or so, we've had this revolution of many FDA-approved drugs uh, and their combinations. Some of these are targeted drugs, meaning they target particular oncogenes, uh, but some of these are also immune therapy drugs. And so now we have many other options to treat the patients. This is an example of a patient who has disseminated disease, who has been treated with a combination of these targeted therapies, and this is extremely effective within weeks. However, within six months, the metastases unfortunately come back and are extremely aggressive. So clearly on one hand, we are starting to understand what we need to do, but this is not efficient enough and we need to understand it further to develop more drugs. So we have two options here. We've been talking about targeted therapy, which is targeting the tumor, but now we're talking more and more about immunotherapy, which is targeting the host. So we believe that identifying genetic changes in the disease will allow us to understand the landscape, but will also allow us to identify melanoma drivers, to characterize them and potentially find for them therapies. But it will also allow us to identify T cells that are reactive towards the melanoma, which will help us also develop immunotherapy. And so in my talk, I'll be talking about both of these aspects. This is the tumor bank I was telling you about and the many clinical uh, collaborations we have uh, in order to understand melanoma genomically. Okay, one of the first things we did uh, in order to understand genomics was to do a whole genome sequencing project, uh, which was available at the time. It was extremely expensive, only of $50,000 per whole genome. So we only chose two samples. We took cell lines and the fresh tumor, performed whole genome sequencing, and a compared them to the normal tissue from the same patient to find somatic <coughs> mutations. This was really to understand whether we can use the cell lines to work on melanoma. And what we found was uh, impressive that 97% of the mutations found in the cell line are also within the tissue, which meant that we can actually use these cell lines to understand the disease. We've been using it over the years, uh, using Sanger sequencing, whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing. We're very 
Uh, and like this, we were able to find various different genes that are involved in the disease. They are summarized here. The ones in red are oncogenes, the one in blue are tumor suppressor genes. And what we always emphasize is not only to sequence, but to actually functionally evaluate what the mutations do. So we actually fill in the gap between the genetics and the actual functional effects, the phenotype. Okay, so once whole exome sequencing was available, um, we, d we decided to perform whole exome sequencing. Again, this was a new technology, expensive, so we were only, only doing 14 at the time, but this was extremely useful because not only we found more genes involved, but we were also able to find out that melanoma is the most highly mutated solid cancer out there. So it's tenfold more mutated compared to other uh, cancer types. So we... Uh, Hmm. So we, the whole exons were able to find that it's highly mutated. The next thing we did was to join in with the Tumor Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which is a consortium in the United States, which aims to look at the landscape of various different cancer types. And what this identified was not only that melanoma is highly mutated, but actually it divides into four different categories in terms of mutations. NRAS mutated, BRAF mutated, NF1 mutated, and triple wild type, which means that that particular set of patients have different mutations. Uh, and w that was very, very useful in terms of identifying new drugs uh, for the disease as well as understanding it uh, genetically. My lab decided to further expand on these numbers, and now we have a database of over 500 uh, melanomas. Uh, of looking at their exomes and their genomes. And so this allows us statistically to identify mutations found even at lower uh, frequencies. What um, uh, this allowed us to do, I'm going to tell you three unexpected stories uh, from these analyses, uh, and then I'll tell you about our immunology uh, uh, project. So I'll start off with looking for oncogenes. So when you look at our database and you look at recurrent mutations, the one that repeat themselves again and again, otherwise known as hotspot mutations, we immediately find the well-known ones, BRAF and RAS, RAC1. But then we see additional mutations uh, down below. So we decided to expand on these and look at them more closely. And what we found was surprising because we found a recurrent mutation in a synonymous mutation, meaning this alteration does not change the amino acid. And they're actually called silent mutations because people usually do not expect them to even have a functional effect. But I couldn't ignore that. We decided to focus on this and keep working on it. Um, what we found was that uh, this particular mutation uh, actually has a very strong functional effect. It, when it's in a wild type form, it inhibits P53. Upon UV, which obviously melanoma is exposed to, P53 will no longer be inhibited. It will move into the nucleus, activate P53 target genes, in including apoptosis genes, kill the cell. However, this mutation uh, does not bind a particular microRNA that usually inhibits the wild type form. So when it doesn't bind this microRNA, the BCL1212 accumulates and it can it all the time inhibits P53. So even when you have UV, the P53 will not move into the nucleus and therefore will not undergo apoptosis upon uh, UV damage. So this was the first uh, study that proved that silent mutations actually have a role to play and they're not actually uh, silent. And so uh, this uh, really took over uh, the news and it, and people started looking more closely at synonymous mutations and they were not to be ignored. So this is the second unexpected story that I'd like to tell you about. Uh, this was done uh, by Dr. Noel Kutub in the lab where she found a particular gene called RGS7 uh, that has recurrent mutations. So it, it has 11% mutations, but these re recurrent mutations, this is the protein, are only in 2.2% of patients. And most scientists or pharmaceutical companies may think this is not enough in order to pursue. But if you look at the p-value of what are the chances of these mutations to occur, that it's actually significant. 
So we decided to follow up on this story, and RGF7 is a regulator of G-protein signaling 7. And so the first thing that uh, Noor uh, did was to actually knock down uh, RGF7 in melanoma cells, and what she saw was that the cells migrated faster or invaded faster. These would be attributes of a tumor suppressor gene. She then cloned, a, this is one mutation that I'm showing you here, the recur one of the recurrent mutations, and when you compare the effect of this recurrent mutation, it reverts what the wild type does. So again, the wild type is inhibiting, and the mutant is reverting this. And so again, it looks like this is a tumor suppressor. We wanted to understand the mechanism behind this, so we joined in with a structural biologist, and so we, she, she actually did for us a model, and she showed that probably this mutation if, is affecting the structure and the stability of the protein. And so we checked if indeed when you add cyclohexamide to the cells over time what happens to the protein, and you see that the wild type is actually pretty stable, but the mutant as you see here is much less stable. So it's actually affecting it in its stability, and if it has enzymic activity, it's probably going to have less enzymic activity. So since this regulates GPCR signaling, this would actually uh, be important, GPCR being G-protein coupled receptors. So we did a biochemical assay, which I won't go into in details, but basically it's a cold breath assay, and it looks at the deactivation of this uh, enzyme, this gap. And what we saw was that if this is the activity of the wild type, the activity of the mutant is half of that. So as we predicted, indeed the mutant has less activity. We wanted to then see if we could stabilize the protein and revert the phenotype. So again, we worked with Masha Niv, a structural biologist, and we formed this dicyphaled bond. And as you see here, it actually did stabilize the protein compared to the wild type and the mutant. And as expected, it did revert the phenotype. You see the wild type tumor suppressor, and this is the, this new compensatory mutation. So the next step was to see what's going on on the, on the expression level, because you see these mutations are heterozygous. Usually tumor suppressor genes are homozygous. So we checked the expression of both alleles. And what we found was that the wild type allele was less expressed compared to the mutant allele in two different melanoma uh, derived cell lines. So we really have here three different mechanisms affecting RGS7. You have low expression of the wild type allele, the mutant protein is unstable, the mutant protein has reduced activity. And all of this is actually reducing RGS7. And so what I'd like to say is that we found a new tumor suppressor gene, we've worked out the mechanism that it works, in. But also, I think it's important to note that we did go in depth here, not only to find the mutation, but really understand it, and that the 2.2% uh, recurrent mutation rate is actually important and does need to be pursued. That it doesn't have to be a very high mutation rate to be functionally important. The next one is talking about uh, tumor suppressor genes. So again, we took to our database, Noir, who is also a bioinformatician, ranked all our beta, uh, database to look for tumor suppressor genes based on what's called the 2020 rule, so that 20% of the mutations had to be uh, the ones that are deleterious. And what we found was a very nice table of very well-known tumor suppressor genes like P53, NF1, but then we found a new one called RASA2. What is RASA2? We'll talk about this in a minute. Um, the f next thing we did was to see <coughs> if it's lost by a race GH, and you see that 36% of patients lose uh, this particular copy of RASA2. So what is RASA2? I never heard of it before. This is actually a gap. It's a GTPase activating protein that regulates RAS, and RAS is the most important oncogene, right? So if something is regulating it, we want to know more about it. Uh, so. We, uh, so that in the case where there's no gap, you would have constitutive activity of a RAS. So we wanted to see where this RASA2 falls in the melanoma landscape, uh, which is, like I described, you didn't see the slide, it divides into BRAF, NRAS, NF1, and triple wild type. And we see here that it coexists together with the NF1 mutations in a significant manner. And so, again, uh, Rand, uh, who's here, she functionally evaluated some of these mutations, 
from Rasa 2, these two, and what, uh, first of all, we found that if we knock it down, it increases the activity of RAS, as seen here. And when you knock it down, it actually affects cell growth, both on plastic and, um, and on soft agar. So it looks like it's also a tumor suppressor gene. We then decided to evaluate it functionally, and I'd like to emphasize when people do functional work, it's important to use the right cell lines. And you see here we chose the ones that have NF1 mutations because these mutations coexist in the patients. And she saw that indeed when she overexpresses these two mutations, <coughs> the cells grow much faster compared to the wild type. And if she puts the wild type back into cells that have mutations, it will inhibit their growth. So clearly it is functional. The question is whether it has a role as a gap protein in these cases, um, and uh, indeed it does. Uh, so you see here that if you uh, overexpress the two mutants in cells that have uh, the, uh, that are wild types, so you see here these are the two mutations, you see the effect on RAS GTP levels that they activates it. So we know that it does work through the activation of a um, gap. Okay, so does it have any prognostic value? We looked at a patient a material, and you can see that it either is lost in expression, intermediate, or highly expressed. And actually, 34% of the patients have no, exp no expression of this protein, and this lack of expression affects survival. So this is a very strong prognostic marker. So we... Um, Hmm. published this uh, in, in Nature Genetics and another paper came out also dealing with these gaps uh, as well as other, other azopacy genes and so it really emphasizes these RAS <coughs> gaps uh, in melanoma genesis and we're continuing to work on this where um, you can see here we went back to looking at the landscape and you can see the co-occurring mutations in RAS 2 and NF1 which was interesting to us because why would two gaps, because NF1 is a gap as well, why would they co-occur in the same patients if they're doing exactly the same thing? And so this is really what uh, we're looking into now, and we assumed that they're probably working together in amplifying the RAS signal, because if you have a RAS mutation plus a RAS amplification, you have this increased activity of RAS and therefore tumorogenesis. If you have a loss of two gaps, you would reach the same situation. So she, uh, so we've proven that by looking at the effect of RASA2 and NF1 on various different RAS isoforms. And what we found was that indeed NF1 affects some of these RAS isoforms, KRAS and HRAS, whereas NRAS affects NRAS. So we think we have here a new model where RASA2 binds NRAS affecting it. We have NF1 affecting H and K RAS affecting it as well. And therefore, you find patients that these mutations co-occur in order to increase the RAS activation to 100% leading to tumor progression. Okay, so I told you about these three unexpected melanoma gene discoveries. Uh, and it really, really emphasizes that in-depth functional analysis is extremely important to really understand the genomic changes. I will tell you about our recent uh, work that uh, deals with the interaction between melanoma and T cells. You know that uh, the melanoma cell will be expressing an HLA, human leukocyte antigen, holding a peptide within it. This interacts with a T cell receptor on a T cell. Now, some of these peptides will be tumor neoantigens, meaning they're derived from mutations inside of the cell. Uh, and these are extremely good targets because they are very, very specific. They only express on the tumor cells, and there's no tolerance for them in the, in the body. So in collaboration with Steven Rosenberg, we wanted to see in, if any of the T cells in a patient are reactive towards neoantigens. Obviously, he's been doing cell transfer therapy for a long time where he takes T cells from patients, puts them back, and there's response, but he never really knew why. So he, we took eight patients who responded to his therapy. We did the whole exome sequencing, derived the peptides, 
and he checked if the T cells from those patients are reactive. And indeed, we found that some of the peptides that we predicted from the whole exome are the reason for the reactivity of these T cells. And so we published this in Nature Medicine, and this really opened the way in terms of looking at neoantigens uh, in the field. And so it became a blueprint now. His lab sequences every patient, looks at the expression by RNA-seq, predicts which of these peptides are going to affect T cell response, they then choose the T cells that are relevant and they will treat the patients based on this. But we know that his work is mainly based on predictions and most of others as well. And it's very time consuming and costly. It doesn't really prove that these antigens are presented by the tumor. So we wanted to find a different pipeline to do this. And so Shelley, uh, who's also here, um, developed this HLA peptidomic pipeline where we take either fresh tumors or cell lines or patient-derived xenografts. We then perform HLA peptidomics. We do whole exome sequencing and RNA-seq. We identify by mass spectroscopy which ones of these peptides is actually held by the HLA. Here we actually remove the HLA from the surface of the cell. We elute the peptide, run it on a mass spec, then identify the peptides. We then test the peptide reactivity, where we incubate the peptide plus the X B cells, plus the T cells of the patient, and check interferon gamma release. And in parallel, we also sequence the T cell receptors. So this is just a proof of concept of one cell line, 12T, where we sequenced, we found which mutations it has, and running it through this pipeline, we found two neopeptides. This is just the way the mass spec looks, uh, where you find the neopeptide <coughs> and the yellow peaks are the mutant. And then we took, like I told you, the expression cells, the B cells from the patient. We added the peptide, either in the wild type or in the mutant form, added the T cells from the same patient and checked interferon gamma release. One of these peptides in the mutant form caused this interferon gamma release, meaning that this is a real neopeptide that elicits an immune response. <coughs> We then developed a melanoma killing assay where we prepare GFP expressing melanoma cells. We check the intensity decrease in each one of these wells and we, <coughs> after adding the T cells from the melanoma patient. And what we see here is that over time, only if you add the T cells from the same patient, you see more killing. But if you see add T cells from a different patient, you will not see this killing effect. And actually, uh, this is a movie that uh, we made showing this kind of specificity. Ah, it works, okay. Slowly, but it works. So you see how the cells are dying one after the other. This is the first one that's dying. This is the next one that's going to die, and so on. So th this is a very impressive situation where you have bulk T cells from one patient and you can start seeing how they interact and cluster around the various melanoma cells and kill them. And we know why they're killing them, because they're expressing these neopeptides. So you can make this very targeted if you start isolating the relevant T cells and put them back, for example, into uh, the patients. So this HLA peptidomic is an extremely robust um, a kind of method to look for these neopeptides. Some of the neopeptides we find would have been missed with the currently used methods. Um, and so we can do it without predictions. And it's cheaper and less uh, labor intensive. And so we are now uh, further developing this. Um, and we've done it now on uh, many different uh, samples. Uh, and what we can find out, which is interesting, is that we don't find that many neopeptides. And actually, this is a summary of other people's studies and we know that they also do not find many neopeptides. But that is fine because if you look at reports such as this one by the Rosenberg group, he found a neopeptide to KRAS and treated a patient based on this and the patient did respond. So we don't need many neopeptides in order for this to be effective uh, in the clinic. So really, we believe that the combination here is probably the best, looking at immunotherapy and targeted therapy together. Obviously, because once you give the targeted therapy, um, this is a review by Jim Allison, you have exposure of the antigens, you have the T cells, uh, the, the, the antigens get uptaken by the antigen-presenting cells, 
activate the relevant T cells, which then come back uh, into the tumor, and the immune checkpoints uh, will reactivate these T cells in order to attack the tumor. And uh, it is believed that combination with targeted therapy is going to push uh, results of therapy much, much better compared to what we see today with targeted therapy and immunotherapy. So really what the take home message is that we've had um, a lot of sequencing in the last uh, decade uh, and now we really not need to start integrating all this information, integrating also all the clinical trials that are currently being done in order to find out what the best combinations are going to be in the future. And this is someone that we collaborate with that has opened the way in clinical trials called Keith Flattery, who has said that after more years of doom and gloom that at care to count we've had this amazing trajectory that doesn't seem done yet. Our confidence keeps rising as our patients keep surviving. And when you talk to clinicians who see melanoma patients, they are very, very optimistic. And uh, so are we. So uh, this is my group uh, at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, mo most of them are here, and so they deserve the credit uh, for what I've been talking about today. We don't only work, but there's a lot of uh, fun going on as well in the lab, so the combination uh, really does help. And these are my acknowledgments. Uh, these are actually people that worked at the NIH when I was there uh, who contributed to this talk as well. Many, many uh, collaborators, as you see. Uh, thank you also, of course, to the patients and their families for uh, these uh, tumors. Uh, we couldn't do the work otherwise. And of course, the um, funding agencies. Thank you for listening.